Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our second live stream event for the fall term. I'm thinking term because I'm a professor at a university, but welcome. We're so excited that you all are here today. I am looking forward to hearing from our esteemed panelists and speakers and hearing about their experience with advocacy as well as the Advocacy Summit. And we're looking forward to hearing from you. You can place your questions in the chat if anything comes up, and we will address those questions as we're speaking with the panelists. I am Dr. Sabrina T. Cherry, your moderator for for today, I'm an assistant professor at UNC Wilmington and also the 2021-2022 Advocacy and Resolutions Trustee for SOFI. Today is a teaser for you. We want you to tune in because we're excited about what we have to share in reference to advocacy, but we also want you to register for this year's Advocacy Summit. We will be meeting virtually, but it will be just as dynamic, just as informative, and just as important. We're watching many things happening around our country during this time. What a great and monumental moment to be tuning into how you can become a better advocate. Now I'll transition to introducing our speakers and then we'll kick off with our questions. Once again, please feel free to put all of your questions in the chat. Dr. Amy Thompson is the Vice Provost of Academic Affairs and Professor of Public Health at the University of Toledo. Dr. Thompson serves as a president-elect of Sophie's Board of Trustees. She is the former national president of Ada Sigma Gamma and completed two terms as the national advocacy trustee for SOFI, where she was responsible for policy and resolution development, as well as co-planning the annual SOFI Advocacy Summit. Dr. Thompson has published over 75 peer-reviewed journal articles and secured nearly 1.4 million in federal funding. Daphne Frias is a 23-year-old unapologetically Latina youth advocate. She, as someone living with cerebral palsy, she is fiercely proud to be a loud champion for the disabled community. As a result, she's created her own nonprofit called Box the Ballot or BTB, which aims to harness the power of absentee ballots. By partnering with students on college campuses, BTB was able to collect more than 470 thousand absentee ballots in the 2018 midterms. She remains passionate about creating change as a freelance organizer, and she spends her time speaking at various summits, as well as on panels like today, and consulting with nonprofits, crafting engaging campaigns that highlight the voices of Gen Z. Marlene D. Edmond is a first-generation Haitian-American professional with 10 years of experience in public health, community engagement, partnership, and stakeholder management. She is MCHES certified and a Howard University Culture, Communication, and Media PhD student with a focus in health communication. She's an active member and the New Jersey chapter delegate for SOFI and the New Jersey ambassador for Black ladies in public health. She is passionate about addressing health disparities, including health equity and health literacy in the Haitian American communities where she serves. Michelle Bildner is the third year DRPH student at the University of Illinois Chicago School of Public Health and has 12 years of experience in public health, education and promotion. She has worked across industries in the health sector and her organizational leadership experience ranges from local government, private industry, higher education, community health, research and evaluation consulting and nonprofit philanthropy. Her work is focused largely on chronic disease and obesity at the policy, system, and environmental change levels, as well as issues of environmental justice with strategies that address racism across sectors in a health and all policies or whole government framework. She is currently the president of SOFI Midwest, covering Kansas and Missouri. Welcome again to our panelists. We are so excited to have you here today. We'll kick off with our first question and I'll ask any of you just to jump in. Don't be shy. Why is the understanding or why is a understanding of public health crucial to beginning a journey in advocacy? I'll jump in. So I, I think really understanding the landscape of some of the pressing public health issues is really important to begin to think about choosing an issue to advocate on. You know, whether that be chronic disease, infectious disease, you know, tobacco, gun violence prevention, 
um, as advocates or, or future advocates, you know, you need to look at issues that definitely need um, the attention of advocacy, um, that need, you know, individuals to push for policy change or to create awareness around some of these very important public health issues. But I think first and foremost, having a basic understanding of, you know, things like incidents or prevalence and some of the challenges to some of our uh, marginalized communities becomes really important. Thank you for that. Jump in if that's okay. Um, well, firstly, I just wanted to do a quick uh, land acknowledgement. I'm on the land of the Lenape people here in the unceded territory of Manhattan. Uh, I think that that's a very important place to always begin, uh, to understand that we are on stolen land um, and that, you know, it's a real privilege and honor to be able to be uh, holding this space uh, with all of you. Uh, and the answer to my question uh, is pretty simple. All social justice is public health. Um, I think if that understanding is not had, there's a crucial part missing in justice making. Um, the uh, public health really is the thread that connects all social justice issues. Uh, because all social justice issues stem from the same systems of oppression. And I think once we can understand the multiple factors that lead to those oppressive systems through the understanding of public health, uh, then is that's when we can begin to unravel those systems and fight for a better future. Daphne, thanks for saying that. I agree with you um, very much. And I am located in St. Louis, Missouri, which um, has was largely occupied by the Osage Nation. Um, and so that's the land that we occupy here. And I think if we even go back to the late 90s, when Nancy Krieger was really um, leading us in the idea of social epidemiology, I think that's where that really knits together the things that you were saying. Um, you know, public health, health promotion, we have looked at um, health inequities um, through population health, and we've worked really hard to understand um, the data and what the data say, but we haven't worked hard enough on really explaining the factors that cause those inequities, like you said, through different systems of oppression. And so um, having that orientation that all public health is social justice, um, you said it so well. Um, and I think we've been called on by our public health education and promotion leaders um, over 20 years to really advance our practice in policy system and environment changes and move beyond programmatic interventions to um, disrupt those systems and structures. Thank you all. Is there anything else that you all would like to add before we move on to the next question? Okay. What public health crisis are you most passionate about and how have you worked to combat or address it? So why don't we start with Marlene here? Absolutely, thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Marlene Edmond. Um, uh, though I'm currently residing in Washington, DC, I am a Jersey native. So hello to all those who are listening and tuning in from New Jersey, especially those in Union County or Northern New Jersey. Um, as far as public health crisis that I'm most passionate about, I would say, um, as mentioned before, health communication. We noticed in the past couple of years how the, um, the effects of misinformation um, has been affecting us when it comes to COVID-19, as well as since 2020. And um, when I was back in New Jersey, I worked with faith-based organizations to engage people within the community and actually talking to them, you know, Sometimes what occurs is what a crisis is that some people don't feel like they're heard. And oftentimes we have professionals, public health professionals, who believe that they're the experts when in actuality it's the community members that are the experts that are living through these different crises, right? So um, basically listening to what people um, have to say about an issue and how we can better serve them. So by going into communities and speaking to 
um, different individuals sharing um, information, whether it's a flyer and or resources where they can go find assistance. We noticed that when we continue to engage them, they would then tap in with their neighbors and say, hey, listen, someone within the community is here talking about X, Y, and Z, and I believe this is something that you can hear too. So health communication, you know, that culture aspect that, that plays a role and um, being first generation Haitian American and where Creole is my first language, being able to connect with um, the elders and, uh, and other individuals in different generations and bridging that gap there. So thank you. Others, what public health crisis are you most passionate about? And how have you worked to combat or address it? I'll jump in. So um, I've been working in the area of gun violence prevention for probably over 20 years. Um, most of my work is, is published probably in that area. And I think that this work is something that is still in its infancy in many ways because of the lack of funding that we have seen uh, under the Dickey Amendment. And uh, I encourage those of you that are interested in injury prevention to really uh, look into the area of gun violence prevention because we certainly need more advocacy and research in this particular area. Um, this is something that uh, is a topical area that many people have shied away from from a number of years because it's a very daunting topic, uh, much like tobacco in, in some ways. But um, this is something that, um, you know, particularly at local level, state level, many people haven't been able to make a lot of progress on because of preemption laws uh, that have been passed to basically block any type of local or state um, gun violence prevention legislation. So I think that speaks even more to the importance of being able to study this, research this, and use that research to turn around and advocate for policies that work. Um, particularly over the last couple of years, we've we've certainly seen, you know, increases in different communities and acts of violence, particularly gun violence, um, as we've seen, you know, some communities even then reduce uh, gun policies. And so I think that this will continue to be uh, a very important area. Sophie, I will be, say very proudly, uh, a couple of years ago, devoted an entire advocacy summit to this topic. And, and so again, I, I think this is a very pressing public health issue. Thank you. Um, I'm going to jump in if that's okay. Uh, well, firstly, Amy, I just wanted to say thank you for your dedication and all your years of research in the GVP space. Um, as a GVP activist and advocate, um, I've read countless uh, pages of your work and it has helped to uh, motivate, inspire, and continue to uh, educate me and my peers, specifically within the Youth March for Our Lives movement, of which I was the New York State Director of. So gun violence prevention is very close to home for me. Um, but specifically when talking about uh, what issues, I think uh, social de determinants of health is something that's very um, important for me as a second generation uh, Dominican American. Spanish is my first language. Um, and I live in uh, West Harlem, New York, predominantly black and, black and brown community. Um, and I have seen all my life how various social determinants of health impact um, various comorbidities and different outcomes in our healthcare um, and in our access to healthcare. And I know that so many of those things are entirely preventable if we just have the interventions and education and take the time to communicate with um, our neighbors and our, and our uh, community members. So something that I've done um, over this pandemic is really trying to have those conversations, albeit in a virtual setting, but really letting people know like there's someone here and there's someone listening. Um, and I think that a lot of times in communities like mine, social determinants of health are just seen as inevitable outcomes without the ability to actually do something to change the course of those outcomes. So trying to have intervention and say like, just because cardiovascular disease and diabetes is prevalent in our communities doesn't mean that that has to be the reality for you and your family. Um, so I think those conversations and understanding social determinants of health is 
uh, critically important. Thank you, Daphne. Michelle, do you have anything you'd like to add? Yeah, definitely. Thanks for everyone's reflections and sharing their experiences. I think um, I agree with you that those are all um, public health crises that we should all be worried about and um, find a way to connect to, um, whether it be through skills or um, through getting educated on those content topics. Um, and I love what you said, Marlene, about um, you know, working with generations of people. And I think that's important because I do believe voting rights is a very crucial public health um, crisis and issue right now. And that's an issue that affects multiple generations. And so that um, idea of communication um, with people and as well as research with people um, and by people, whether it be on gun violence or other issues, um, I think um, really, we can expand the thread, right? Where is community centered in this work period? Um, and how are they communicated with? And um, I won't disagree with social determinants of health. And I think uh, the root structural issue of racist being, uh, racism being a public health crisis, um, it's very performative to, to say that. Um, and so where can we see the action? Um, and similar to Sophie taking a stance on gun violence, I'm really proud to um, be able to share um, their sentiment on um, anti-racism. And I think as um, a white identifying person that my work um, on addressing racism as a public health crisis does start with the individual. Um, and I think that if I can compel other white women, white people um, to really start to understand how to undo that in their own lives, um, that's one step in the right direction. Um, and it's an ongoing learning journey, absolutely. Thank you so much for that, Michelle. We have the North Carolina Sophie Conference coming up and, and one of the speakers at that conference, I've been thinking a lot about how it starts with us, right? We're so quick sometimes to jump on the front lines to tell everyone else what they need to do, but what's the inner work that we can do in the work within our own communities, within our circles. Um, so thank you for raising it. Thank you all for responding. I'd like to kick this to Daphne first, and then we'll come back to you, Michelle. Um, what are some local or statewide initiatives that you've been involved in? I know you've talked a bit about this. I mentioned some of this in your bio, but can you tell us a little bit more about some of the initiatives that you've been involved in? Sure. Uh, so my work really uh, grounds itself in three specific areas. So that'll be gun violence prevention, the climate crisis, and disability justice. And the the core of my work is really helping others to understand that these are intersectional issues and these are not issues that should be treated in silos. Um, and oftentimes off the bat, people are like, those are three radically different issues. How are they connected with each other? Uh, and for me, it really stems from uh, a public health perspective and understanding that the, as I said earlier, the same systems of oppression that lead to the gun violence prevention are the same, is the same reason why we have a climate crisis. And disabled folks are at the front line of many and almost all of those issues. I like to say that all justice is disability justice. If you're not including disabled folks in your justice making, then your justice making is not as holistic or intersectional as you might think. And I think intersectionality is a huge buzzword that is often misunderstood. And if you're not including disability in that conversation, there needs to be some reevaluation to your justice making. Um, but specifically, um, I, I have been working uh, with the March for Our Lives Youth uh, organization since its inception. Um, and in 2019, from 2019 to 2020, I was the New York State Director of their uh, whole entire New York operation. So I oversaw over 40 chapters, 200 students. Um, and we also helped to work with our former governor to pass um, extreme risk protection orders, which is a um, a very important law that helps um, to ensure the safety of community members um, by allowing them to be an active participant in um, letting law enforcement know of uh, a individual who has possession of a dangerous firearm. We also um, help to uh, make sure that racial justice was a proponent of gun violence prevention and understanding that our that our black and brown communities are about three times more likely to experience gun violence 
than any other community. Uh, additionally, uh, in terms of the climate crisis, um, I helped to make my undergrad university single use plastic free. So I worked for two years to pass, uh, to craft and pass student legislation that uh, removed single use plastic completely from our campus. And although it's been about three years since I've graduated, uh, they still are implementing those strategies that myself and other students have helped to create. So really um, letting people know that, especially for young people who are going to be attending the advocacy summit, that your age is not a determinant in, in your power and your power comes from your individualized stories and the things that move you and impact you um, and to show that young people are, are powerful and that similarly as I am here we deserve a seat at the table and not only a seat at the table but a megaphone because we have inherited so many of the issues that are plaguing our country and our nation um, without really a say into where all this falls on our lap um, and that can be very overwhelming and pressing and anxiety inducing but taking back the control and saying I have the power to do something about it that's where the change happens. Awesome Daphne thank you. Michelle what about you? Daphne I'm so glad you um, kind of ended with that sentiment around um, you can be any age and especially you can be a young person and engage in advocacy because um, it reminds me of the work that we did here in one of our local jurisdictions, um, actually in both St. Louis County and St. Louis City, um, to raise the minimum legal sale age of tobacco to 21 before um, the federal government in recent years um, has adopted that. And of course, we're still waiting on states to enforce in other jurisdictions due to, um, due to the way the ordinances are set. Um, but when we work to develop the policy um, for Tobacco 21 and the implementation, as well as the enforcement, um, youth were a very loud voice. Um, if we didn't have youth um, in our public quorums um, at our county council meetings, um, I don't know what things would have looked like, um, as well as other advocates. Um, coming to speak. Um, and as a practitioner who is really providing that evidence base and the um, implementation enforcement strategy along with our enforcers um, at the health department, you know, really that collaboration, um, I, you know, it wouldn't have been successful. And of course, raising the age does mean that younger people won't be um, accessing tobacco as likely as they were would be if they were 18. So there's a win-win as far as youth is concerned. Um, and I think most recently um, with the COVID-19 pandemic, um, we were able to stand up a data work group that turned into a strategy group um, that really pushed for extending the eviction moratorium in the city of St. Louis um, before the feds, um, you know, extended that as well. And so um, that was some really powerful individual advocacy to some key, um, I don't want to say stakeholders because that is a word I'm trying to stop using, um, but to some key um, proponents, right, to, to really push that moratorium forward some real um, activism there. Um, and I think along the way of environmental justice, there's been other opportunities, even really recognizing in my community that we have a vacancy problem and that vacancy of vacant buildings is a public health issue. And really talking about how the social determinants of health um, relate to that and how that uh, vacancy impacts health. And so, um, joining work groups and providing the evidence base and really just awareness around um, different upstream issues, um, as well as demolitions that, you know, if they're not safe, uh, they keep, they're not healthy, they're spreading lead dust, they're spreading particulate matter, they're increasing the high rates of asthma that we already have in our communities. And so I found my way um, into advocacy in different topics um, at different depths um, here in St. Louis. Okay. Thank you for that. Yeah, Amy. Can I just add, Daphne, as, as I was listening to you talk, and I've taught about advocacy for a long time, your comments remind me when I talk to my students about advocacy that, 
you know, if, if when you're advocating, you can't get a seat at the table, bring a chair because you need to get in there and make sure that you're, you know, having a voice with decision makers and, and stakeholders. And, you know, the other thing I often say is, you know, where you see, uh, you know, a wall, you know, try to make the window. And, and that really is important advice because with advocacy, these are really tough issues. You're right. These are social justice issues that we are trying to move the needle to improve our population health and a lot of quality life for people. And, and so these things take time. You know, it, 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 George Washington was the first president to ever propose universal health care coverage. And, and look how long it has taken us to, to even get, you know, some resemblance of, you know, the Affordable Care Act. So this this is not for the faint of heart. It has to take a lot of perseverance and, you know, resiliency to, to go in there and feel passion about a variety of different public health issues and know that the buck stops with us in public health because you know often we can't look to to others this is this is our niche this is one of our professional responsibilities to advocate and to make a difference for for people that sometimes don't know how to advocate and don't have a voice thank you for that amy um we'll move on to the next question and i'll Ping it back to you, Amy, first, and then we'll jump over to Marlene and then go to Michelle. So we're talking about advocating and maybe there's some people who are listening, chiming in today and they're like, oh, I've done this before. I'm just here to re-up my skills. But there are others who've never, ever advocated before and they're nervous and they're scared. And then Amy just told you it's going to take forever right, to get anything done. So that's where the advocacy summit comes in, right? Equipping leaders to be able to do this work and do it for the long haul. So Amy, can you tell us about your experience at previous advocacy summits? I know there've been a lot, but pick some of your favorite and what, what was your experience like? So I want to just say that I started out, you know, over 20 years ago, going to an advocacy summit and it turned me on to advocacy and this type of work. So I started out just like any other graduate student, you know, showing up to Washington DC and, you know, learning about how to advocate and, you know, talking with people that do this kind of work and learning the skill set of persuasion. You know, this really is when we, we use the word advocacy, it really is about creating awareness it really is about persuading individuals around particular topics. And, you know, this is really about skill training. And in, in our particular uh, upcoming advocacy summit, you know, there's defined topics that we will be providing information around and then teaching individuals how to have those persuasive conversations with decision makers, legislators, you know, key individuals. And I want to be really clear about something. You don't have to go to Washington, D.C. to be an advocate. In fact, in my opinion, most advocacy happens in your local communities, on your school boards, on your college campuses, you know, at your state legislative offices. It can be changing policies that affect your day to day lives where you live and work. Um, so, you know, this doesn't have to be that you you go to the, you know, to the Capitol steps in D.C. to do this process. In fact, in our field in public health, this is something you should be doing on a daily, if not weekly basis. That's part of who you are. That's part of your professional identity and really, frankly, part of your personal identity, because this is what we do. We make our population health better. And it, it really requires us to pay attention to all those issues on a daily basis of what's going on around us. So the Advocacy Summit helps us polish those skills and helps us realize how important it is to do this all the time, right? Thank you for that. You're speaking my language, Amy. I just believe in that 
the, this work is everyday type of work. It is everyday type of work. And it's the work that we do in our local communities. Yes, it's important to go to DC. Yes, it's important to know our representatives, but this is the work that we get to do every single day in our communities. Marlene, what about you, your first app or any of your, your experience with the advocacy summits? Absolutely. Um, my first advocacy summit was the 21st annual summit um, where I actually met Amy. And um, I'm, um, I'm a big advocate for when I say, you know, we learn by doing. And at that summit, I had an opportunity to work with Amy in different um, different subgroups. And I love the fact that at the summit, it's not like you're sitting in there, you're learning, you know, you're learning and hearing from different from presenters, but there are breakout sessions where you can meet other public health professionals from other states, meeting other public health professions, professionals who have um, a passion for a specific public health crisis, and you're learning from other people. Um, a, other people of color, um, other people that may be more passionate or more understanding um, in one area. And now you're taking the opportunity to say, well, you know what? Let me jot that down. You know, let me get this person's contact information. So the summit is more than just learning. It's an opportunity to network with one another, being able to connect on LinkedIn, social media. Everyone knows that I am big for saying, hey, let's follow each other on LinkedIn or on Twitter or on, on Instagram. And that's where I had the opportunity to meet a lot of my um, Sophie um, connects and those who I have a relationship with where now we can you know share information on online. So if you are a person with a social media platform, you know, you are an advocate. If you're sharing, whether you're sharing information on the opioid crisis, um, which was the topic for the twenty one, the twenty first annual summit, or if you're sharing information on Black maternal child health, right, or infant mortality, I have different public health professionals that I'm now friends with, who I also consider my colleagues, who I know that okay, this is Dr. Cherry's area of expertise, and you know I want to tap into this to this topic, so I know that you know I can connect with her, and she can share this information. So building that web, building that network. And that's what the uh, tw the 21st annual summit um, was like for me. And I look forward to it and continue to share um, and, you know, speak highly about it amongst my my peers and my colleagues in the in the field. Awesome. Thank you. Michelle, what about you? Your experience with previous advocacy summits? Yes. Um, similar to Marlene, I was lucky to attend the 22nd annual advocacy summit um, with the 21st Century Practitioner Scholarship. And I do think that's a good um, plug uh, for that award uh, for students as well, for both um, Sophie National Conferences, um, that it's a great way to warm up um, to the organization. Um, and so I was able to, even though I had been get engaged in advocacy um, before that, um, and this was a virtual um, meeting, um, it was fantastic. Um, I didn't know what to expect, but like Amy was saying, and Marlene too, um, there was content knowledge that was uh, dis shared, and there was also skill-based knowledge that was shared around how to advocate. Um, and I think for the summit that I attended, uh, not only did I learn a lot more about climate justice, um, but I also practiced those skills by um, talking with my legislators, um, getting on the phone and talking with them and using the talking sheets um, that Sophie graciously developed and then thinking about, well, what about climate is really important to Missourians, um, for example, since I'm here, you know, and for us that be flooding. And so really, what I'm saying about that is one of the skills that I took away, and it, maybe it's a reminder, is that really when we um, engage in advocacy, we do need to adopt a systems thinking approach. And we because these problems are so complex. And so um, that's one piece. And I, and I got that from the summit um, that echoed with me. Another um, piece that I received is really that we do need to know our audience. Um, we do need to know what our decision makers, um, what their values, loyalties, and potential losses are um, so that we can engage in effective communication. Um, and also picked up on the reminder that we um, in this field need to develop more strategic partnerships and alliances, which is definitely an advocacy skill. Um, and so... I think one of the best examples of what I learned 
um, is actually on the Sophia Midwest website. Um, we just launched an advocacy page um, that captures some of those exact examples. You probably engage in advocacy more than you realize. Are you sharing information on a health topic? Are you sharing um, uh, legislation or candidates that's on the, the ballot, right? Or are you sharing something that needs to get on as a, a that is a ballot initiative and you want it passed, Medicaid expansion, for example, here in Missouri. Um, and so I was thrilled attending and definitely encourage anyone to attend um, the summit. It was fantastic. Thank you. We're going to um, veer a little bit from our script and take a question from our viewers, one of our viewers. And I'll ping this to Amy and Daphne first, and then we'll round robin again to Marlene and Michelle if you'll have anything to add. Are there any tools and resources for students specifically who want to make their public health voice count? Daphne, do you want to take it first? Okay, sure. I just wanted to jump back a second to the last question. Um, so actually, I believe it was, and bear with me because these two years feel like a non-existent blur, so I don't really know what years the things are happening right now. Uh, but I think it was in 2019 when um, March for Lives National, we had a letter delivery event where we delivered over 600 letters to uh, Congress people and we actually ha held meetings with uh, about 20 Congress people trying to get them to sign on to universal background checks. Um, and some of our graduate student leaders had attended past SOFI summits. And some of the things that they told us that they felt confident about being able to um, have these meetings with our legislators was uh, sort of the speaking sheets and the speaking guides that Sophie had given them to prepare to be in these rooms. And when I tell you those students were on fire and we were able to get um, more co-signers onto um, universal background checks than we had anticipated, um, I really was able to see the power of the Sophie Summit. So if there's any uh, young people out there specifically who are wondering sort of like what happens after the Sophie Summit, I promise you there's skills that you're gonna learn there. Um, that are going to take you into experiences that you're going to have within the field um, to actually make a difference. And when Universal Background Checks passed the house, some of our graduate scholars who were at the lobby day were there. Um, and it's just uh, sort of a full circle event that it started with the Sylvie Summit and that they were able to see uh, some fruits of their labor by seeing uh, Universal Background Checks move in this direction. So I just wanted to put that positive note out there. But to uh, answer the question, I think one of the most positive resources you can have is finding community. Um, this work is can feel incredibly isolating because you sometimes feel like you have the weight of the world on your shoulders, especially as young people with your whole life ahead of you. You're like, well, if things are this rough now, how are things going to get better? And that's something I ask myself a lot. But the way that I remember that it's going to be okay is to understand that I don't have to carry this weight by myself. Um, and the way that I found community is through the importance of conversation and really um, speaking with people who on the outset may not necessarily embody the quote unquote professional look of what a public health um, scholar or professional might look like and I think that's a whole other conversation about dismantling professionalism, but um, really understanding that community advocates who have been dedicating their work, their life to this work, who are grassroots organizers and maybe don't fit in the academic setting of public health, they are equally as valuable and important to this field as any one of us. Um, so really finding a mentorship uh, for me in community and finding mentorship in elders has been a uh, very, very critical to helping me understand that um, not necessarily is there a hierarchy to public health, but there are people who've been doing this work before us. And that you're not just coming in here blazing a trail and trying to be like, I created this. No, there's a foundation of people who've been doing this work before us. And we must honor their sacrifices and we must honor their work because they've built the foundation for us to even get to the point where we are now. There, you know, especially as a woman of color, 
what uh, people of color have sacrificed their lives for decades to be on the forefront of public health issues, but we have rarely gotten the credit for the for the work that we have contributed. So understanding that um, entering this field, there's a legacy and you can pull from that legacy and find elders and support members who are going to uplift you, who are going to teach you, who are going to mentor you. And I think one of the best resources I've ever done is cold emailing people or cold messaging people, people that I don't know, but I feel inspired by and saying, I really love your work. Do you have any capacity to take on a mentor or have a maybe 30 minute conversation? It can feel scary because you're just putting yourself out there. Um, but some of the most important people in my life and in this field, that's how I've met them. So I'd say take the initiative, um, find people who inspire you and reach out to them because they might be uh, your greatest connection and your greatest asset. Awesome. Thank you so much, Daphne. Amy, and then we'll ping over to Marlene. Yeah, so there there is a SOFI uh, advocacy toolkit that we have that's also available in terms of resources. You know, th there's also lots of other advocacy targeted organizations. And, you know, you, you pick the topic out there, you know, many other groups, Human Rights Campaign is another example, um, Planned Parenthood, you know, they, they, they have advocacy information that's out there that you can utilize. It doesn't just have to be from Sophie. And so I think that's, in fact, I encourage you to look at other sources because I think that helps us understand, again, the landscape. Um, the other thing I'm going to say is I think that when we're advocating on a particular issue, keep in mind that there's also groups that advocate in opposition of our public health stance. I think it's important to understand what those groups are advocating and what their position is, because that will often be your counterpoints as you're going in and advocating. And I'll go back to my example of gun violence prevention or tobacco control and some of the, you know, hot button public health issues going out there and looking at what are their talking points and what are their, you know, advocacy materials for, you know, from, you know, those types of groups are really helpful because then you know how to craft your messages as well. So I, I think broadening your your use of different organizations are really important as you're, you, you know, creating talking points to advocate in terms of, of resources that are out there. APHA, you know, again, a very strong partner with SOFI. Uh, is a fantastic organization that has a very strong advocacy arm. So that's another wonderful resource as well. And Amy, can you speak to the availability of the toolkits? I know there's some things that are archived, for example, on YouTube, but are the others available to the general public? The toolkits that Sophie creates? Someone asked that question. Um, you know, I would have to go and look myself and I apologize. I don't know the answer to that. There's also um, modules, and I know because I created one of them. <laughs> There's also advocacy modules that Sophie houses that you can go in and take that um, are more information regarding advocacy as well. Thank you. And we'll come back to that. We're, we're, we're investigating behind the scenes on what you can access and how much information you have access to, to the person who asked that question. But Marlene, I know you wanted to chime in as well in terms of resources for students specifically. Absolutely. Um, I know Daphne mentioned community and community is important. I remember um, I remember being a student and navigating, you know, um, as a navigating as a student, but not finding my community until after I graduated. And I wanted to connect with other black women in the field. And then um, a friend of mine and I, we came across black ladies in public health. So connecting with other um, Black women in the field was important to us. And as far as students, students may feel like, okay, you know, um, I have to send this person an email. But with with the way technology is growing in, in the direction where, you know, sliding into someone's DMs is very, um, is very simple. You know, Michelle and I, <laughs> it's just like, that's how we met. And I've met, I've been meeting a lot of, a lot of public health professionals in that manner where, you know, students are asking me, you know, what's the appropriate way? And it's like, what are you deeming appropriate? You know, um, oh, I want to do this in a professional way, but according to whose standards, you know? So understanding that you can, you can 
informally introduce yourself to someone via Instagram and say, hey, I'm such and such, and this is what I want to learn, and this is um, the direction I want to go. And as Daphne said, you know, can you be that mentor? Can you be that guide? Um, I myself did that most recently where a friend in Chicago introduced me to someone via Instagram um, DM. Um, no, another um, resource I would share, the Society for the Analysis of, of African-American Public Health Issues, S-A-A-P-H-I, for those who are looking to connect with other um, Black individuals in the public health space. Um, that was very important for me um, at that time. So I also got engaged um, in NJ Sophie. I got engaged with Sophie um, as the chapter delegate. So for me, um, my resources look my resources, my tools, my advice um, has the foundation of engagement. So my my theory was always like, okay, my thought was always, you know, how can I be more engaged? Who can I connect with? Um, what what skills do I need to continue to become the public health professional or health communicator that I want to be? And um, tapping in. So for me, um, as I mentioned, um, engagement, you know, sliding in DMs, um, reaching out to people, uh, connecting with them at um, events, whether it's virtual or in person, when we can meet in person. Sabrina, can I say one thing? Yeah, about that? absolutely. I, um, in working with students and um, having taught students in the last three years, I would um, say I'm I'm proud to have served as an advocacy mentor, um, but. The um, where students can find the opportunity is in not being afraid to try to message someone to engage in conversation. Um, you know, I am a DRPH student right now, um, so I am taking advantage of some student membership fees, <laughs> right? So even joining APM, um, Association for Public Policy Analysis and Management, right? It's fairly technical. Um, if any APM folks are out there. Nice to meet you. Um, but there's a lot of, you know, this is the time to explore and to try new things and um, to, again, look to those um, agencies and organizations that are engaged in a policy advocacy issue that you're passionate about and see who they are, when their meetings are, what you can join, who you can informationally interview, so on and so forth. It, it's really taking that step to, to go for it and know that um, we all started somewhere um, is kind of what I'm hearing from folks too, so. This next question um, speaks to some things that you all have already mentioned and it is what advice do you have for a first time advocacy summit attendee? So what I've heard is you all talk a lot about community. You've talked about networking, right? Formally and informally networking with others, connecting with them and maybe following up. Marlene, I think I heard that. It's not just okay to slide in the DM, but you need to follow up, right? <laughs> Make sure that you're, you know, kind of closing the loop on the communication. What other advice would you have for someone who's attending the advocacy summit for the first time? And I want to, as you all answer this question, I want you all to think about someone, something that someone told me, which was there's a right way and a wrong way to do a conference. So what are what are the right ways to do the advocacy summit? And anyone can jump in to answer this. Be a sponge. Be a sponge. Um, if there is, and if there is a networking session where you know there's breakouts, be brave, <laughs> and and go into that with an open mind um, and be prepared to learn and reflect on your learnings. I think that's. Um, I don't know about the right and wrong way to conference. I think that's really interesting mm -hmm. um, because I've learned as I've went, and um, and even when you do that, you learn what didn't work. So I think, yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I need to reflect on that, but um, it's one thing to hear things and, and listen, and it's another to reflect on what they mean to you. Um, and so that double loop learning is gonna help you become a better practitioner. So that's, that's what I would say is probably the biggest, is to reflect on what you actually take away. I would also like to jump in. Um, I've been harping on this, um, the notion of networking, but, um, engaging and engaging not just during the session but after the session you know um dr sherry you mentioned the closing loop and following up but also engaging on social media now that everything is virtual one thing that um i like to do i like to schedule tweets i like to um search hashtags and see who mentioned what and say oh i might want to follow this person and you know um retweeting their tweets um, connecting with individuals on Instagram, seeing what they're passionate about as well. 
So that, le that level of engagement needs to be there. Um, even providing additional feedback or a response to someone's message on Twitter, um, engaging in those, um, I forgot what Sophie calls them, the, the tweet live sessions, right? There are different um, opportunities to, to engage with others. E even if you may be someone that, okay, I may be shy in person, but if social media is a great opportunity for you to engage with someone, you can engage with them and then later on say, hey, you know what, Dr. Cherry, um, let me, I'm, I will send you something via DM right now. And then, you know, you can take that conversation offline and continue to say, hey, you know, I'd like to, I'd like to network even more. I'd like to connect with you outside of after this conference and see where that goes. Thank you, Marlene. I'll come back to that, but I know Amy wanted to add something as well. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, if anything, you know, any materials are sent out ahead of time. If there's any type of additional webinars that are held in preparation, I for, because we often do that, um, I would highly recommend attending those. The other thing I would encourage is get to know more about your legislators. So, you know, a particular um focus for Sophie is usually on federal legislation. So I would start learning now about your, 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 you know, state and federal, your federal senators, representatives that represent you get to know what their, you know, platforms are, what, how they voted on public health issues perta pertaining to social determinants and health and, you know, get to know personal things about them you know, are they from urban areas, rural areas, you know, do they have kids? You know, all those things really matter because when you're talking to them, it's about personal stories that you share. It's about persuasive talking. So, you know, if, for example, I'm going to use going back to what I know, gun violence, you know, if you have somebody that is representing a lot of urban areas where there tends to be higher prevalence of gun violence, you know, that's a great way to weave in, you know, your constituents, there's a high prevalence of gun violence here. You know, this is something that's impacting lots of people. You know, uh, you know, I know you have youth and you, you have kids, you know, this must be something that you must be concerned about. You, you know, I mean, there's ways of tying in their backgrounds to the issue that you may be advocating on. And that's when you become a really effective, um, advocate is because it's, it, it becomes a conversation instead of, I need you to vote on this, this way, you know, you don't want to freak them out, right? It's, it's more of a, a informative conversation with a very persuasive type of approach. Um, and, and knowing where they, they are, you know, where they live, their backgrounds, you know, what, what has shaped them is really important because that's how you're going to approach them in that persuasive speech. Does that make sense? So doing that homework in advance is really, really helpful. I love that idea that you can prep for the conference, right? That you can come to the conference, not just like an empty vessel, but you've done some homework before you got there. I also love um, what Marlene mentioned in terms of social media has a new twist. It has new power these days. And so Marlene, I don't know if you remember, but that's how I found you was because you tweeted about my hair. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes. You presented so, and I said, I love her hair. <laughs> so there is power in these sort of informal channels for reaching out and connecting people, really not just across the country, but across the U.S., across the globe, right? We can connect with people that we may not have ha had access to before. And to Michelle's point, I would I was like the scholarly person who would highlight all of my sessions when we had paper copies of programs. And these are the sessions I'm going to. I think that's the wrong way because you may meet people, to Marlene's point, once you get to the conference and you want to switch things up. Or maybe you get to a session and someone didn't show up or it's not what you thought it would be and you want to leave. But I would just stay there. So I think that those are some examples of not, you know, the wrong way to do a conference. <laughs> I'd like to add something. You know, you mentioned the highlighting, something that I um, I did once is that I attended at least one or two sessions on a topic that I don't know nothing about, or I know very little. That way it created an opportunity for me to learn more and say, hmm, okay, I never thought of this in this manner, or, you know, oh, okay, this this may open a new new door for me and to learn, to dive deeper into that, that area in public health. So yes, of course, if, you know, health communication is your passion, that's great, but you may want to dive deep into another area, whether it's epidemiology or, um, 
or any other um, area that you you are unfamiliar with, but you know, at least one or two sessions. I love that. I had trouble finding my cursor. So we're going to make this our last question. And again, this is our teaser. So we did want to hear from all of our expert panelists. We wanted to hear about your experiences with advocacy, what you're doing in the field and what you've done. But again, we're really plugging the Advocacy Summit because we want you all, those who are listening and tuning in, to know how amazing of an experience this is. So our last question is, there are many professional development opportunities. I know that we all agree. There's so many things we could be spending our money on. Many of us are Zoomed out. And so why would I show up for another conference that's virtual, right? So why is this opportunity different? Why is the Advocacy Summit different? What makes it special? Um, I just wanted to chime in from uh, experience of uh, students who have told me about their experience with Sophie. I think for them, a lot of conferences can feel like you're being spoken at and not being like invited into the conversation. And I mean, if you're spending like the whole day having someone speak at you, it's like very draining. Um, and I think what's the feedback I've heard about Sophie is that you feel like you're enveloped in the conversation and you feel like, you know, it isn't so much like the speaker versus the participants, it's a community of people in a room sharing knowledge with each other. Uh, and I think um, other academic programs are not necessarily like that. It can feel kind of cold and stale, but with Sophie, um, it's really an inviting um, place. I also think that Sophie does a great job of diversifying where they show up. So there's the pre-conference webinars, there's the there's the Twitter conversations, there's the summit, there's so many different ways to engage. So maybe if one medium isn't for you, you have multiple different uh, venues to try to find where you fit into the Sophie community. And I think that that is really special because a conference setup might not be for everyone, but I think what Sophie does great is it diversifies the experience of a conference. Um, I also specifically in this year, I, I always love that Sophie tries to highlight uh, graduate students work and giving graduate students the opportunity to be part of the field before sort of they reach the conclusion of, of their studies. So saying that like you're already part of the community. You don't need to be sort of finished with your schooling to to sort of be part of Sophie. Um and highlighting student presentations is something that I think is always super important because that's where the fresh and innovative ideas are coming from. Um, and I think if we can put our finger on the pulse of what students are thinking, we have a better understanding of what the trajectory of our community is going to look like. Um, so it really gives you a diverse view of professionals who have been in the game for a while versus people, uh, versus our scholars and our students who are just starting to make their mark on the field. And I think having uh, that spectrum of representative uh, voices and stories is incredibly uh, important and something that Sophie does really well. Thank you so much for that, Daphne. And this year is the first year that we actually have our student poster showcased. And so we have a student voice uh, front and center at this year's summit. Anything else that you all like to add as we wrap up today's live stream event? Just register for the Advocacy Summit if you haven't. It's a wonderful experience. It will definitely enhance your skills and you'll get to meet, as we've heard, some wonderful friends and people to network with. And um, this is, again, this is something that you need to do in your professional career, but in your own personal lives as well. Thank you, Amy. Thank you again to our panelists and thank you all to our audience for showing up today. We appreciate you and we look forward to seeing you at this year's Advocacy Summit. Have a wonderful afternoon, everyone. Goodbye.